From my perspective, again, looking back on it, several different things were going on that, that led to what became Sesame Street. One was what I just described, the programs we were funding at Carnegie. Although we, we were funding these programs, the problem we were dealing with was much larger. At that time and at the present time, there, there are roughly four to four and a half million children entering school in any year. And our programs at Carnegie were reaching perhaps a few hundred, maybe a couple of thousand children. Of the four million children that are entering school each year at a uh, conservative estimate, 500,000 needed such help. So there's a huge gap between what we were doing and what we were trying to achieve. Now, if, you're, if, if you really believe that, that is, if you really believe that the programs you're funding have potential value and you find you're only doing a very small part of the job, it creates a problem in your mind. How are you going to overcome it? Um, so that was, that was part of the background. A second uh, element was that our older daughter, Sarah, was born in 1962. And when she was about hmm, two to three, that would be 64 or 65, <coughs> uh, I would come out on a Sunday morning when we typically slept a little later than usual. And Sarah would be in front of the television set in the living room watching the station identification signal. Uh, and it struck me there was, there was something fascinating to Sarah for certain about television. And it, again, there's little dissonance in my mind here. What is a child doing watching the station identification signal? What does this mean? I didn't know. I didn't know. But that, that was in the back, back of my mind also. Third thing was that in Los Angeles, one of my oldest friends now, Julian Gans, uh, we met in junior high school, so that would have been in 1941. I still know him. When we moved from Berkeley to New York, Julian said, you ought to get in touch with my cousin Joan. You would, you would like her. This was in 1958. And I didn't do anything about that until around 1961 when I did call Joan up. And we had a, obviously this family connection, my old friend and her cousin. We got together, I think, first for lunch and we became friends and we began visiting back her home and, and my home. And Joan was in television at the time. Uh, we didn't talk about television much, but I knew, I knew about it. And that led to the dinner party, which I oft told tale now, in I think February 1966, when Mary and I went to Joan's apartment for a dinner. She was there, of course. Uh, she was then married to Tim Cooney. And Lewis Friedman, who was her boss at Channel 13, was also there. After dinner, we were, as I remember it, we were standing around probably a four or five of us, and <clears throat> I said, Joan, do you think television could be used to teach young children? Where did that question come from? Well, it, it came, it came, all, the only way I can say it is it came from the other things I've told you about. It came from my experience with my own daughter watching the station identification signal. It came from the experience at Carnegie where we were not doing the job we wanted to do in terms of numbers. Joan's answer, again, as I remember it, was, uh, I don't know, but I'd like to talk about it. So after that, she and Lewis Friedman came over to my office at Carnegie, and we did talk about it. And as we talked, <coughs> it became clear that we didn't know enough to have an answer to that question. Can television be used to teach young children? And we talked around the idea of having a a feasibility study done to see if that could be, if it could be worked. And I think Lewis was the one who said, Joan wouldn't be interested in that. And Joan spoke up and said, oh yes I would. <coughs> so 
That then led to our providing funds for Joan to lead a conduct a feasibility study on whether television can be used to teach young children and how. And in that, uh, she did a couple of things. One was because of what I've said at Carnegie we were doing, we had um, many contacts for her to follow up in the educational, psychological, uh, research, social science research areas. She had a lot of contacts in the television world. And so what she did was she went around talking to people about ideas and, uh, and asking this question and trying to figure out whether or not indeed it could, it could work. And the feasibility study that she completed late that spring, probably, oh, we made that money available in uh, February or March. She probably completed the study in June. When she completed the study, she came to the conclusion that, yes, it probably could. We didn't have a definitive answer because it hadn't been tried, but her, her her uh, tentative answer was yes, the answer was probably yes. And in the feasibility study, she suggested some ways that might be useful. Among other things, uh, the idea of a magazine format was suggested that because we thought that young children's attention span might be short, that the, ep the, the uh, segments in the television show had to probably be relatively short. I believe that she also came up with the idea of using uh, Laugh-In was a very popular format at that time and the early Sesame Street really capitalized on the Laugh-In format. So there were a lot of ideas there as to how something might work. There was no show developed in the feasibility study, rather it was you know, here's what we know about psychology, here's what we know about television, here's how they might be put together in something that would be appealing and uh, teach children, teach young children.